as everyone's getting on, a um, couple of things that we're that we're going to do very briefly is just um, do an in introduction, a little bit of housekeeping matters before we turn it over to um, to Matt Weber, and then I can take my big huge scarf off. But I was trying to be a little bit, uh, you know, memories of the football game <laughs> out in the cold that we used to have. So next year for sure. Um, so without further ado, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'm Pam, as I said before, Pam Callery, uh, president of the UVA Club of Charlottesville. Um, a couple of things I already mentioned that we bring you in on mute. Um, and we're going to, because of the large number of people, stay on mute. Um, after Matt's presentation, we will have Q&A. So chat box function is always in the upper right for most people, maybe sometimes down in the left that there's three buttons there and that's where we can communicate. So if you've got questions as Matt is speaking, things that you wanna ask at the end, um, please put them there. I'll be monitoring it throughout the course of, um, of the night. Um, so we will definitely have a chance to, um, to answer everybody's questions. A little bit about the UVA Club of Charlottesville. We're one of one, over 100. You know, people have probably been on a million Zoom calls with us or other clubs nationwide. And, um, you know, we exist solely for our alumni, our parents, and our friends of the community of Charlottesville. Um, and we have done a lot of virtual programming, which has been fun. And we can't wait to get back to things that are in person. Um, and, uh, and just a little side note to that, as the spring comes and vaccines and things like that, if you are interested in volunteering with us, or if you want to know any more about our club, we're so happy to let you know more, either me or, or Robin or, or Michael, just reach out to us. There's always opportunities. There's always availability. There's always things that can bring you in, um, in the manner in which... Is, is most easy for you. So just to just to say that. Um, and I want to thank everyone who answered um, the email that we sent out about our scholarship. We're so proud to have had to have an endowed scholarship. We have had this for two years. And um, because we weren't able to have our holiday party this year, we really relied on your donations. And we're so grateful um, that we we're able to um, to able to, to get some funds in for a rising first year for next year. Um, I'm gonna introduce Matt now. Uh, Matt did not give me a bio, so <laughs> it's because he's very humble, but I'm gonna just let you know that he, of course, is the senior assistant to President Jim Ryan, formerly head of digital at Harvard Graduate School of Education. He is an Emmy winning writer and most importantly, dad to Rose and James Henry and husband to Dr. Chef now. And we say chef because she makes some good pizza. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Matt. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for being here. Uh, this is a, a real treat. And before I get started, I, I, have, to, I have to give major kudos and, and big thanks to the UVA Club of Charlottesville and the whole UVA Club's Office of Engagement uh, that whole team is just amazing to work with. And I'm pretty sure, Pam, and you can nod up or down or whatever, nonverbal or verbal, your preference. But is today your last day as president of the Charlottesville Club? Oh, so <laughs> I, I say, yeah. yeah, I say, what a way to, I'll, I'll try to have you go out with a, with a bang. Or if I really screw up, you can resign and it won't be that bad. Um, no, you'll just have to resign. And with the, with the club since 2005, since the beginning, and um, it's just been a wonderful time. So honored. Yeah, so thank you, Pam, for having us. And Robin, I hear it's your one year anniversary as well, too, of uh, being at UVA. So lots of things to celebrate, including um, why we're all here today. Um, uh, and by the way, seeing so many familiar faces show up here, friends from all around the world, um, it's really it's really special. So. So thanks for just everyone who I'm, I'm looking at right now and get in gallery view and recognizing 
uh, people from my life here in Charlottesville and, and beyond and work friends and professors and family members. And I've got to give credit to, I think my wife is up there in the play. So she's also, we're really going to test the bandwidth of our, of our home Wi-Fi and Ivy. That's my little daughter there and my son and my wife, Dr. Nell O'Donnell, a wonderful person. Um, and my children who are just so special. So thank you to everyone. And you're like, okay, wrap, okay, get it, wrap it up, wrap it up. Okay, I'm wrapping up. So here's what I wanna do with y'all today. Um, first of all, I would love to start my screen share and um, jump in and ask you a big question. Can you all like a couple heads nodding, see what's going on there? Is that is that a picture? Is that me? So you're probably thinking like, why in the world did I sign up for some sort of public lecture that that is that has this billing like that is the graphic um why would you come and and i guess you know when i was thinking about publicizing this it's you know mid december there have been many things to think about this year ups and downs and craziness and and pam said can you send me a title a couple titles and can you send me a headshot and I actually thought, okay, I've got my traditional headshot. Um, but I thought this headshot, which I took the maybe five minutes after she asked me to send a headshot, just with my little iPhone, I thought this was the appropriate 2020 headshot that we should all have to some degree. For me, it's a look of bewilderment. It's a look of three-year-olds and one -year -old, a one-year-old and a three-year-old climbing on me while I'm taking this photo. It's the look of all of the different things that we as a world have been putting together. And I thought this is an accurate headshot. And I thought that that would hopefully at least signal to all of you what this talk is about. What is Zoom, this thing that we're on right now? And why am I calling it a love story? And by the way, I did send Pam um, an alternate, I sent her an alternate screenshot I thought maybe, you know, we could go instead of the Zoom route, we can go the, the love story route. So like, again, I've got this like long, weird pandemic hair now, and I've kind of pulled it back. And I, I typed in Harlequin romance novel templates, and I found this. And I thought, okay, Pam, like, you've got, you've got two options here. And at the time she was probably like, gosh, I really just should have Googled image searched this guy instead of taking these two things. But I thought like, okay, here's the love story part of it. Here's the Zoom part of it. I'm gonna try in the next like 30 or 40 minutes to try and collectively bring us together of why love and Zoom should be how we think about the next hour or so. Okay, so what is love? And in my opinion, okay, I'm gonna totally just drop my screen share right now. Hey, let's get all interactive. We know how to teach on Zoom now, like it's been going on for a while. And the best thing to do is to be like, hmm, what are all of these tools down here? Screen share, chat, breakout rooms. And I promised everyone I wasn't gonna send you to breakout rooms because some people are like, okay, I just wanna eat my dinner in peace. By the way, it's six o'clock in the Weber house. And tonight's chat is brought to you by Annie's Mac and Cheese. <laughs> Toasty peanut butter crackers and nothing but the best, polio, string cheese. That's what we're eating, folks. And I totally welcome you all to eat as well. But I do want to just check in with you really quick. Um, just, you know, there's 86 people on. Um, if you can access the chat, that would be great, you know, and you can probably put in the chat, Matt, you don't need to scream. And I appreciate that. I'll, I'll do my best to modulate. But why don't you just throw up there and you can use decimals, scale of one to 10. I think before we talk about love, we have to engage with each other in this Zoom community. Like, how is everyone doing? And I just want like a numeric, quick, like temperature reading, you know, like what is it? Where's everyone at right now? And I'll start, I'm, yeah, I'm like, you know, somewhere between, a, I would say I'm like a 7.4. Uh, higher right now because of all of you. I see Heidi Johnson is an eight. Just throw it up there, Ellen. Whoa, okay, on a 10 point scale, there's a 23. Oh my gosh, so we got some eights, we've got some sixes, a nine, a seven. You know, so we got some variation. 
some nines, a 6.4, a 100. Okay, that's my wife. She's totally the plant here. I see a six. <laughs> okay, so too early to tell. Okay, <laughs> getting some humor. I've got, I've got by the way, I, I am teaching tonight or whatever you want to call this. Um, but I, I have great mentors on this call, both in Jerry Starja and Brian Pusser, who were my teachers. I'm in a doctoral program at the education school, and they both totally mastered um, teaching on Zoom for the past year, and I just have to give them major credit. And glad to hear that they're doing okay. So I'm looking, I'm looking, and again, there's a point to this, I promise you, and we're gonna get to some interesting factoids. It looks like Taylor. I don't think I, Taylor, um, I'm not sure if I know Taylor all that well or have ever met Taylor. Maybe I have. I don't know. But Taylor, as far as I'm concerned, looking here, I'm hoping that, and don't anyone else steal this. This is for Taylor. In the chat, Taylor, is a $25 gift card to Grubhub. Let's get that five to a 5.3. Dinner's on Matt Weber tonight. Back to the presentation, Taylor. Hope to meet you one day in person. Where is this? How do we talk about love? Let's show love through the form of Grubhub gift cards. By the way, Grubhub, if you're watching, you know, lower the fees, please. Okay, act one. I told you it was three acts. Act one, a history. So what is this? Zoom, love story. Um, but let's just talk real quick about, like, let's go way, way deep here and get meta and talk about what does the word Zoom, not talking about the company yet, but what does the word Zoom mean? And anyone can go to their dictionaries and figure it out. There's a couple different definitions there. Um, and it's good to kind of frame that up. There's obviously the Zoom of the camera, there's the sound, and then there's the movement, right? So then there's the, uh, entomologic, the entomology for Zoom. And, you know, what I'm thinking about here is, and, and I'm wondering, um, entomology for Zoom. Um, before we even jump in on that, I just wanna check real quick. I see some people here with a furrowed brow. What's going on here? Um, entomology, is there something wrong with this? Can I cold call someone? Mark Llewellyn looks, he's laughing. Um, I'm trying to figure out, entomology of Zoom. I'm gonna go in and ask Mark Llewellyn, who, who looks like a guy who knows how to unmute his Zoom. What's going on with that slide, my friend? I just can't get over your energy, my friend. <laughs> all, brother. It's just, it just brings a smile to me every time I watch you. Okay, back to the show. Entomology, <laughs> oh my gosh, if you thought I embarrassedly thought I was thinking of a different world, no, entomology, the study of bugs. There are no known entomological species named Zoom. Just wanted to clear that up. But most importantly, I would love to focus a little bit more on the etymology of the word Zoom. Again, let's go way back. Act one I did say was history. Zoom, the etymology, look it up. 1886, 1886 is the first known time that we see the word Zoom, this word that is now the word of the year to so many of us in, in our lexicon. And I looked it up and I said, okay, 1886. And then it said the word imitative. And I just kept thinking to myself, okay, um, imitative. I've never heard that word before. What does that word mean? And then realize, hey, you know what? It's imitating. It would be imitating uh, the sound. And if you think about it, to move, right? With a loud, low hum or buzz, like the word zoom comes from just the sound of zoom. Think about this. That's where it starts. That is zoom. And I think just kind of teeing that up, like, as a framing device, if we're really talking about the history of Zoom and how it came to be, like that's a good starting off point. And then like probably beyond the etymology or entomology of Zoom, like fast forward to 1972. And I wasn't around yet, but this was something growing up in the Boston area and the Massachusetts area. This is something we all knew about because they redid this show later on in the nineties. Zoom, this was a big deal. This was a show for kids, by kids, for kids, 
when I first heard about the word Zoom, it was this whole notion of like, hey, we're gonna let kids run the show. We're gonna, and here, here's the origin, zoom in and zoom out. We're gonna zoom in on the kids' lives and we're gonna zoom out on how that affects you in the world. And to me, if you think about it, or if you talk to anyone from like, you know, grew up in the 70s or 60s or whatever, like this is a seminal show that connects to this word that we're now hearing in 2020, Zoom, the show. Again, maybe you totally missed the history of 18, the 1800s. Maybe you don't have Merriam-Webster books or the internet, and maybe you don't watch TV, but you happen to be driving around and maybe you saw a, a commercial somewhere uh, and Mazda. To me, that was a big deal. Zoom, Zoom. That was what they were calling their campaign. Um, in Hiroshima, Japan, the arena there is called Mazda Zoom Zoom Arena. They've recently sort of tried to phase out the Zoom Zoom, but like another word that is in the world, you know, whether it's an advertising campaign or not. And then like very personally for me, um, think about where you hear the word Zoom in any context of music. And I gotta tell you like this song, which I'm not gonna, I'm not call calling on anyone. Um, I'm tempted to with Mark Llewellyn to see if he can sing this, but like, this is the song that my kids sing. Zoom, 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 we're going to the moon. And it involves a rocket ship and all sorts of stuff. Again, I don't know now if you're watching this or if the kids can hear me, but like, that's a thing. And she can validate that if she's doing the thumbs up or maybe she's changing a diaper, I don't know. Zoom, 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 <laughs> we're going to zoom. So like zoom is, before we even get to 2020, it's out there. It's part of our lives. It takes on all these different sort of parts of our lives. It has all of these different meanings. And to be honest with you, there's people who probably already love this word. This was something that we were comfortable with. And that's why I think honestly moving into 2020 with it being a thing, an entity, a brand, an experience, a new verb, a thing that we're doing right now, I gotta tell you like there is history there. This is the Zoom that you all probably signed up for. This is the Zoom that I know you all have because you are watching this on Zoom. And I have to tell you, like, for me, the love part is, do I love Zoom? Do you love Zoom? And if so, like, there are types of love, okay? There are lots of different types of love. That I'll bring up the Greek, the Greek uh, types of love. And to be honest with you, I felt like for me, and I don't know about you all, but like for me, it was all in the philia. It was this notion that there was a friendship and a partnership that I had with Zoom this year and that we all kind of had. It wasn't really a choice sometimes. And to me, it started off and it may be there, just a friendship of utility. This is a friendship that makes sense. There is something there, there is affection for it. It is the reason why we are all able to communicate and collaborate today, but I don't think it's beyond that. It's not a friendship of pleasure or friendship of the good. To me, I treated Zoom kind of like a sibling, a sibling who I love, but a sibling who like I kind of needed in this context, which leads us to act two. Now we have some history underneath us. We look at what's going on here. It's a tragedy, it's a comedy. 2020 was both of those things, a tragedy and a comedy. Um, this is another image that doesn't need any explanation, um, but this was a difficult year for a lot of people, a lot of people. And I think about all the different experiences that we've had collectively, even looking at the number of people on this call, uh, 89 folks, like you have all experienced 2020 so differently, and yet we all share something similar. Um, and to be honest with you, we've zoomed in on these experiences purposely, and we've also zoomed out on them, um, perhaps out of, um, out of some sort of way to maintain our mental health. And I just sort of want to bring you down the Zoom channel of like, what is Zoom? And how did it kind of become a part of this whole 2020? I mean, Zoom at its core, so now we're not talking about the word, the show, the slogan, but we're talking about the actual product that we're using right now. And again, 
American studies major, higher ed guy, don't, don't ask me anything more about the sort of broad cursory information that I'm gonna share with you about this tech company. But like in general, like what is at play here is this whole notion of video telephony comprises the technology for the reception and transmission of audio video signals by users at different locations. Anyone you got Wikipedia, that's a fact. And I gotta tell you, this is something that we all think in 2020, like this notion of everything that's old is new again. I think back to the scenes in Scott Stadium of people during the Spanish influenza wearing masks. Uh, I think back to this image, um, like just make a mental note, like what do you think this is? When was it taken? What's the deal? Guys, this is the prediction of the year 2000 by a French artist in 1910, before the for previous pandemic. But this is like this envisioning of humanity connecting through this way, audio, video displayed in some sort of unique way. I gotta be honest with you, that's not terribly far off. Um, that machine looks like something that would be in my wonderful English department neighbor, Dr. David Vandermeulen's basement. It looks like a really cool thing that he, that he would have. But like in general, like this to me is not that far off. And to be honest with you, like look at science fiction, 1968, 2001 A Space Odyssey, again, around that millennium mark. He's got someone talking to his daughter in a similar way, not totally, but that doesn't look so different than what we were doing right now. And, and again, looking at my daughter, maybe, I, again, I, she's not in my view, but I'm, I, I could be. And I, I think like, that's not all that different. And then as this evolves, right? This telephony, video telephony, it's the Kyocera VP210 visual phone, the first commercial mobile video phone. You guys ever FaceTimed or Skype? This is kind of like the advent of how that's all working something from like Dick Tracy times, you know, you look at science fiction from a hundred years ago, that could be the current situation of today, which brings us to what is Zoom? We refer to it as Zoom. There's all sorts of different ways to Zoom. It's a verb, it's a noun, the company's name. And again, you're, you're talking to an American studies major who's gonna give you a little business lesson. So I really feel bad for the, the Jerry Starges and the Peter Brooks listening to me going, oh my gosh, Weber, stick to what you know. But anyway, it's called v Zoom Video Communications Incorporated. That's the name of the company, like the founder, you might wanna know like how we all got here. Like the journey of the founder is interesting. This guy, Eric Yuan, who used to work for Cisco, which again, Cisco, WebEx, these were all different ways in which people were engaging. Left Cisco, 2011, brings 40 engineers, and he names the company. Wait a second. What does he name the company? I kind of want a cold call on someone. I think there's a Catherine McGarren out there. Catherine McGarren, can you unmute yourself and guess what Eric names the company? Zoom. Maybe anyone? Okay. Hello. Does he name it Zoom? That's a great guess. Thank you. Whoever said that. Again, I can only see a couple of people right now. No, Eric names it. And again, I'm not 100% sure I'm pronouncing this right. I looked this up for a good 30 minutes to figure out A, the origin and B, the pronunciation. I think it's called Saysby. He names the company Saysby. So he leaves Cisco, starts this company, has his employees, and he's trying to get into this video telephony, video conference market, which is a tricky market. You know, if you went on to Shark Tank right now, they'd say really, 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 really kind of crowded space. Good luck. The tech's tough. So he realizes that Saysby or whatever it is, is like probably not the best name. So he's like, okay, we got to rename this thing. How about we call it Hang Time or Poppy or Zippo? <laughs> and he picked Zoom. They picked Zoom. Uh, but again, like I think back to the origins of Google, I'm pretty sure Google's name before it was called Google was something akin to back rub. Uh, again, the evolution, the growth. Let's look at the metaphor here for ourselves. Like 
hey, it went from Saysby to possibly Zippo, and now we're on Zoom. Well, how did we get to Zoom? Okay, May 2012. So this isn't that long ago. Okay, um, the company changed its name to Zoom, influenced by. And again, I'm reading this, and I'm thinking, okay, this is probably some sort of really fancy British novel, Thatcher Hurd's book, Zoom City. And I'm thinking, okay, um, probably like you know, akin to. The Time Machine by H.G. Wells or some sort of fancy thing. And then I actually Google it and I'm like, oh, so the thing that we're talking about right now, Zoom, is based on a board book for toddlers around Zoom City. And I'm going to read you the introduction. For active toddlers exploring their world, this energetic book bursts with the noisy sounds children loves to imitate honk, honk, beep, beep. Zoom City zooms with cars and dogs on the go. I told Pam that she would get a dramatic reading and there you go. Again, like this is kind of from one of the venture capitalist people saying like, hey, he's got this cousin. He's gonna base this name off of this book that he was reading to his kids. Makes me think I read my kids books every night. Am I going to be cousins with someone who in like 2040, has like this major company called goodnightmoon.com, um, the Lorax space industry, whatever. Again, I got to work on that, those pitches. But like this idea is I love this fun little book as much as my little kids. This guy hoped to use the name someday for the perfect company. So he was saving the name from a kid's book for the perfect company. And it all kind of came together. It embodied the same values of creativity and exploration and happiness and trust. The name works perfectly with a product that connects us visually to one another and that always works so fast and seamlessly. And Eric was grateful, grateful that he got this name, Zoom. So again, just some of the business stuff in case you are interested, like this company took off. And I'm not even talking about like now in the pandemic, it started off great. It was initially, it was IPO'd. It made a lot of money. The share price jumped 36 bucks or 36 bucks a share, jumped up uh, by 72% on the first day. Like the pandemic made this definitely like out there, but it was already doing well beforehand. But then look at some of the numbers. February, 2020, Zoom games, 2.2 million users in 2020, more users than it amassed the entire year of 2019. And this is kind of right as the pandemic is breaking. One day in March, the Zoom apps downloaded 2.3 million times. Average users jump up, stock prices jump up. June 2020, the company's valued at $67 billion. This is yesterday, 400 bucks a share pretty much. Look at that chart. Again, um, December 16th, 2019 at 66 bucks. $395 is what it was yesterday. Um, so like this is a product that we are using that has obvious had saturation that has grown and has grown exponentially because of the pandemic. You wanna talk market cap, this thing that we're using right now, $140 billion market cap over much more than say like an Exxon Mobil. And then even like, you know, hedging some of this stuff so Zoom has been gangbusters, but in November, they announced we've got a vaccine, stock price drops 15%. So you start to think about, okay, Zoom, I love you, my little friendship of utility, but as the market wonders, do we, how long do we need you? Zoom, Zoom, how much do we love you? And again, this is the stock price from today, up 0.87% on the very same day that Matt Weber offers Zoom a love story? Huh, I'm not gonna say causation, but you know, at least give me correlation that perhaps Zoom is benefiting from this major, major public address. <laughs> Joking, can't see your faces. Hopefully some, are, some of you are laughing. Zoom, by the way, is not a perfect company by any means. There have been major issues, uh, security lapses, poor design choices, software issues. There's been all sorts of like governmental issues. So like at, at any point, 
don't have me think that I'm super bullish on this being the product that is perfect. In fact, it's not, it's kind of, oh great, what happened here? What is that? Is this a Zoom thing? It looks like wingdings. Let me just hit the Zoom button that translates. It can be glitchy. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so Zoom can be a little bit glitchy. That's true. Um, okay, so like moving on, um, we've endured, um, we have endured this movement, this pivot, this adjustment to Zoom as a nation. And I'd love to highlight, because I know this is the UVA Club of Charlottesville. And I'm not like a totally, in like totally, um, established member of the Charlottesville and UVA community. I came here about three years ago, two and a half years ago. Gosh, I love it. Big fan, um, getting my doctoral degree uh, right now and at the wonderful education school, Bob Pianta, Brian Pusser, uh, Jerry Starja, all sorts of wonderful people. Justin Thompson's my advisor, like really great place, giving them a plug. Don't even know if they're still on, hopefully they are, but if they're not, that's fine. We've endured a lot. And I think UVA got a lot of this stuff right. And I think UVA was able to use Zoom like a lot of the rest of the country and be like, okay, you know what? We're gonna do this. We're gonna brotherly or sisterly love you. We're gonna partner up and we're gonna see how this works out. And I have to tell you some of the things that happened on Zoom were pretty amazing. I mean, this is a wonderful story that you might wanna take a look at after this presentation. This is a woman named Pam who was in hospice who was able to graduate early from the School of Nursing. She was able to have everyone show up, everyone. President, deans, senior leaders. And that smiling face just absolutely um, is captured through this platform. And I just don't know if everyone would be able to get there to wherever it was happening if we weren't in this sort of Zoom environment. I'm gonna look at the arts who watches Arts on the Hill out there, who's watched any YouTube video in the past 11 months and seen one of these things, these sort of checkerboard boxes of everyone trying to do their thing, recording virtually, editing. By the way, these are really talented musicians who got really good at editing because that, as someone who knows how to edit video, that is a very hard thing to do, to either record on Zoom or to, do that. In fact, I thought maybe, I mean, let me just get out of our, our thing here. Um, hey, everyone, like unmute yourself. And I just want to show you how hard it is to record music. We are recording, by the way. And if this turns out great, I think this is going to be potentially released as a hit single um, through the UVA club and maybe be their biggest fundraiser. So just everyone unmute. Let's give ourselves um, two bars, something non-offensive. How about jingle bells on the count of three? One. Is there a time machine I can borrow? <laughs> you guys did a great job. That was probably um, a, a nice attempt at showing, like making good music is hard. And you guys, I gotta tell you, give you big, big credits. I, uh, next time I see you, I've got all sorts of fun um, ways to thank you for that. Um, but like <laughs> music is tough. And these students, these students who were juggling so much made beautiful music, ceremonies continued. I love this ceremony here. This is an army ROTC commissioning ceremony. I love the backdrops of all these. Think about the backdrops that I'm looking at of all of you right now. The fact that I'm not in my study right now too, like in a weird way, the backdrop, whether it's real or whether it's like something that's kind of fake is the accessory, like the mask of 2020. Who are you? It's not what pants you wear, I promise you. No one's seeing that, but it's the mask. It's the backdrop. It's what does this say? Says, you know, says whatever you want it to say, but you had that choice. Zoom allowed you, whether it was through a fake backdrop or a real one, to express yourself in a way that you typically wouldn't if you were in a conference room at Madison Hall. And by the way, if I show up at a meeting with some sort of weird backdrop at Madison Hall when we all come back, please 
someone fire me? Okay, and then the other thing that's happening too is like Anthony Fauci came to UVA and he came through Zoom. And by came, he like, you know, zoomed in through the medical center hour. And I thought that was fascinating because I, through my home, through my computer, in addition to everyone else at UVA and the Charlottesville area, could access the guy on the pandemic. And I think like Zoom allowed us to do that. Zoom allowed that interactiveness. Zoom allowed that direct communication. And I think it did it in a way that was very different. It felt real. It felt like there was a live TV show going on that was in-house produced and we were the live studio audience. Um, and that was, I think, pretty cool. So again, on a personal note, what Zoom has allowed me to do, um, uh, like right when the pandemic broke, all the students went home and we decided in the president's office that we needed to bring Cavman out of hibernation in the storage closet and make sure Cavman like gets to bring joy to people. Make sure Cavman gets to go out there and socially distantly and safely connect with people. But also like, hey, if your mom's tired and lonely in Oregon or up in, you know, down in Brazil or whatever, like, we can take care of that. You don't have to be at the place, um, you know, you don't have to be at a, a local Charlottesville uh, senior center to get Cavman. And I gotta tell you, over the course of several months, members of the president's office dressed up as Cavman and they visited close to 2000 people, whether it was in person or whether it was over Zoom. And I have to tell you the personal experience that I had was, and again, like, I think I'm retired as Cavman so I can out myself that, that gentleman in that outfit is me. Um, but when I was on Zoom, I got a request to drop in at a happy hour of someone who, who had a terminal disease and they just wanted Cavman to drop in and say hi and to wave and to bring joy. And it was a Zoom bomb of Cavman on a happy hour of someone. And I have to tell you, in that head, in that Cavman head, I was weeping. And it was a smiling face and a waving face. And I was weeping tears of joy that I was able to bring this joy to this gentleman. But I was also just so sad, so sad for these people. And so sad that this was happening and just was upset in general with the world. And I have to tell you like in general, like Zoom allowed those experiences to happen. Zoom, Zoom allowed those emotions and, and that joy. Uh, Zoom didn't allow, by the way, I showed up, this is at, um, this is at Martha Jefferson house. I don't know, maybe there are people on this call right now at Martha Jefferson house. I showed up as Cavman and they said, hey, 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 we got a great idea. Why don't we put a mask on you? And I was like, oh, and I can't talk because I'm Cavman. So I can like kind of go like this, like, no, 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 no. I, I can barely breathe in the head. And they're like, no, no, Cavman, it's gonna be great. You're gonna love it. So let me zoom in a little bit. That is a oversized, um, like essentially for me, way too slowly, um, like kill me. It was pretty nuts. That thing went over my mouth. And after like every 10 minutes, I had to kind of look away, pull the thing down, take a big gulp of air, put it back up, dance, dance, dance. And then I just totally like ran to my car afterwards. But like things, things that happened in, in, this, in this year, pretty nuts. Again, like, how did we yeah. do this? UVA group sending care packages so that people can kind of have some fun. This was a group of students at UVA. These were musicians. And they were saying like, hey, you know, the musical telegram model? Why don't we, why don't we kind of take that during this time, provide some money for, for musicians who probably aren't able to work that much right now. And to be frank, you know, bring some joy to people. So all of these requests kept coming in. We thought we'd get, you know, like 20 or 30. They talked, they did a story on NPR on this, they had Daily Progress. All these groups love this idea of these UVA students doing these musical care packages to the point where Veronica Merrill, who is the sort of co-founder behind this, she's like, Matt, like, I don't have enough musicians for the number of requests coming in. And it was one of these things where they would get requests. Can you send this to my grandmother? Can you send this to my son? Can you send this to my first year? He loves this song. And what we do is we'd send them over email. The subject line would be a musical care package for you. You'd open it up and you'd click on it. And it was a personalized video uh, of bringing someone joy and allowing musicians to have a platform, which we thought was cool. And I'm gonna embarrass someone on this 
line, well, not personally, but there's someone on this call who I won't say, uh, but he made a donation of $250 to donate 25 of these musical care packages to uh, children in the cancer ward um, at UVA hospital. And it was all of these little moments, um, these little experiences that Zoom enabled, that Zoom allowed music through Zoom, through video um, to kind of get out there. And, and here's where I'm gonna take a brief pause to give you a sense of like this whole teaching, hybrid learning, hybrid teaching. I have the rare distinction at UVA right now, by the way, don't look too closely at those gray hairs. They're not, uh, they're, they're not doing me any favors. Um, and the hair is gonna go too, which is why I think I'm growing it out right now. But like in general, I have had this weird experience of being both a staff member in the president's office. Uh, I've been taking two classes and I've been teaching classes. So I've been a student, a faculty and a staff member this past year. And it's given me this really holistic, well-rounded perspective of what is learning, what is teaching and what is service at this university and all the sort of complexities. And if you don't mind, I had this wonderful class at the Batten School. I saw Ian Solomon was on. Ian Solomon, like super, super nice guy, if you don't know him, super talented. Again, if, if he's not on the Zoom call, if he's already left, totally fine as well. I'd say that behind his back, in front of him, wherever. One of the nicest guys in the world, super smart, great leader for Batten. And um, I taught this course called The Art of Communications at Batten, and I had great students. It was an asynchronous, synchronous experience. And the day, that I was gonna come in and teach was after all of this effort, all this time to think about what it meant to teach at UVA in this context. And I had the experience and in the space of like what T.S. Eliot would say, there's a great quote where he says, you have the experience, don't miss the meaning. And I think about that often with just this experience today. Is this the moment where we are finding the meaning in 2020? And for me, it's a form of journaling, journaling, but for me, I wrote an essay on my experience being a Batten teacher in person on that particular day. And if you don't mind, I'll give you a break from the cadence of what I'm saying right now. And I'd love to, to read something to you, um, if that's okay with you all. Yeah, so far so good. Is that, are our numbers declining? What are we at, like 30? <laughs> we're doing okay, Eight, we're still in the 80s, okay. My worst fear is it's like, Oh, 15 minutes in, it's like a concert and people are like, oh, you know what? I came for the opening band and Pam Kelly. And then you're just like, okay, get through it or go find that caveman hat and cry. Okay, here's the, here's the essay. So we can treat this kind of like a story time. So pretend my Zoom backdrop is a fireplace here and I'll kind of change my cadence a little bit. If you wanna take yourself off video, if you wanna relax, Take a breath in. If you've got something to drink, drink it. Again, I mentioned to Pam, I said, is there a signature cocktail for my talk? And she's like, or pa Michael Getz was like, yeah, what is it? And I was like, it's, it's apple juice in the Weber household, but this is just water, but it is my very on brand University of Virginia mug. John Jeffries, Mark Llewellyn, remember, honor the future. Big swig, here we go, okay. I wrote this after my first day of teaching in person. The Mr. Good Bar is a fairly simple candy bar. It's chocolate and peanuts, that's it. Introduced to the American public in 1925 with an iconic yellow wrapper. This is roughly all you will learn from its Wikipedia page. There's something very refreshing about simplicity these days. Simplicity almost feels nostalgic circa 2019, when things were less of a daily dagger and fire juggle, teaching in 2020 seemed to fit this bill for sure. Now on background, I've been moonlighting as a dual appointed wannabe college professor over the past four years. I've been donning tweed jackets and elbow patches with the ambiguously titled position of preceptor at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, now with the less archaic title of lecturer at the University of Virginia as the historic fall 2020 semester approached, I was scheduled to teach one of the in-person classes being offered. 
It's a small graduate level course taught synchronously and asynchronously to, to one student in Korea. And for second year MPP students at the wonderful Frank Batten School of Leadership and Public Policy, the course was called The Art of Digital Communications, apropos for the moment, messy art for sure. Now I had just taught in the summer before fully online to 52 UVA undergrads and was energized to try it again in person with graduate students. Based on the numbers, the infrastructure improvements, the safety additions, there were reasons to give this a try. After all, this was a watershed moment for teaching. It was an itch that presumably we wanted scratched and UVA and the Batten School were more than prepared for it to happen safely. But over email, I needed to double check with my students. Quote, before I send you a finalized syllabus, I just wanted to see how everyone was feeling about in-person versus online instruction. I may consider just moving it online if that was everyone's comfort level, but I'm totally excited and fine to be in person too. Just wanted to check and make sure I had a good sense. The sentiment amongst the students living in Charlottesville was that we ought to give it a shot. And so history unfolded tweed and tie and toe, I marched masked down the academical village toward Rouse Hall, arriving 45 minutes before start time. I was doing this. We were doing this. COVID was the bane of our existence for the past six months, but today it was not going to push us out of the way. It was not going to push people or pedagogy down. Screen time be damned. I used my eyes and I used my feet to enter that building, I found the classroom with plexiglass and Purell outfitted like a salad bar in Sneeze Town, and I plugged in my laptop. The excitement, wonder of wonders, classroom technology instantly synced with my Mac, screens descending, all quiet on the set, lights, camera, action, literally. You could see the smile through my mask. It's just teaching, I thought as I settled in. But it felt like so much more that day. It felt like just being there was a victory, a small stand to a big germ. At 2 p.m. on Zoom and in person, students arrived. And for two and a half hours, it was the sort of rubbing of your belly and tapping of your head, all while repeating a tongue twister, stretching in online classroom learning dynamics, feigning confidence in uncharted hybrid teaching techniques, and striving to deliver the golden goose that was halcyon classroom instruction. It was not simple, and I will let my course evaluation serve as epilogue to the efficacy of that day, but this story today, my friends, is not about teaching or my tweed, or the fact that I wore sweatpants to class that day as social commentary to online learning trends and a humorous wink to those in-person attendees. Rather, this story today is about Mr. Goodbar and Miss Hendy and Mr. Teese and Miss Morrissey, some of my wonderful new Batten students who upon learning that one of their friends and Batten classmates could not attend in person that day, he was quarantining due to a possible exposure to COVID, wondered if we could do something to help lift his spirits. Now, I am a card carrying member of Costco and the father of two small children. So naturally I carry snacks in my bag usually a lot of snacks. And for those students who arrived in person, they were plentiful that afternoon. And once we determined just how many snacks were remaining, a student plan was concocted that I should bring a care package of leftover goodies to our quarantining friend, Mr. Demeglio, who lived nearby. And as class wrapped, so did a bar of chocolate and peanuts clad in yellow, traveling along with some other additional kids' food items. In the quiet of a quick jaunt down University Avenue, a hastily arranged package arrived with care, commissioned out of love and distantly commemorated with yet another historic photo of now a second person that day, Mr. Demeglio, wearing what I can only describe as business casual dress pants optional. 
nothing really extraordinary happened. But something sweet and ordinary did. And those minor footnotes in the academy have been sorely missed this semester. And I don't claim to know what will be the salient learnings for me or my students in this hazy pursuit of education. But what I do know is that amidst the cacophony of COVID, it is the timeless and simple lessons of care and kindness that will sustain us. Right now, life is nuts. And so we respond with nuts and chocolate and love. So this is when you all tell me I was on mute. Is that, is that, is that, did that happen? Did, did it, did it work? Again, I was reading, so again, you don't have to clap or anything, but I just want to make sure no, 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 don't clap, don't clap, no, don't clap. Uh, uh, so anyway, like, again, big kudos to, again, I have to thank Alex Hernandez, too, who started me out teaching at SCPS. Uh, pretty amazing leadership at UVA, um, and just so, so glad to be part of this year and part of what was going on. I wanted to show you, that's me. See the Mr. Goodbar? I'm gonna tell you a little secret. I brought those in because I actually don't like them. <laughs> don't tell anyone. I don't like Mr. Goodbar, so I gave them away. Um, and then that's me. See, I, I, I wore sandals and I wore those pants, uh, sweatpants, by the way, like maybe you care or don't. Sweatpants again, again, whatever. Um, and then like that was the care package. Those are all goodies from Costco. I threw in a cab daily for Mr. Demeglio, who's a great, great student, nice guy, so that he could read something, you know, and have a little bit of civility during um, a difficult time. I dropped that off, sat in my car, and then he came out like 40 feet later and picked it up. It was, it was a nice moment. And it was, a, it was the first time where I was like, you know what, this year is, uh, this year is nuts for sure, but we're gonna do our best with it. So that leads me to our final act. And again, I want to thank the 75 of you who have stuck with me. Um, thank you. Uh, comedy, tragedy, history, we've, we've touched it all. Like, what is this? I got to tell you, I think Act 3 is now reality. Um, what are we doing? What is all of this? Uh, look at our poor president. March 2020, looks like that. August 2020, looks like that. I mean, this is a tough... This is a tough time. You saw my gray hairs. Um, like this is a time where we are changing as people. Uh, that's obviously a joke. That's a cartoon. That's the guy from Up. Um, but I do think this is a time where we are looking and we are listening forcibly through these technological platforms in a way where we have never been asked to do that before. We, we, know this intellectually, but right now, gosh, the past year or so, you've been looking at yourself, whether it was in video or whether you don't have your video or whether it's a headshot of yourself. I mean, like I'm looking at myself right now going, okay, well, I, I guess I, I wear my hair this way. It's kind of a pretty big forehead and I'm not really like, I'm not centered correctly. And, shirt is not great. I guess I should buy starch or something, but like, okay, this is something I just did in 15 seconds. And there's history here, right? Like this is the same conversation I had with myself in March where I was like, okay, I'm on Zoom call number 500. This is kind of what I think I look like. You're probably looking at me going, uh, are you sure about that? Uh, and then I'm like, okay, you know what? Matt Weber, new man, COVID doesn't need to get a haircut, looking at myself every day, let's try something else, can't control a thing, but I do think I can control my hair growth, not color, but growth. And I was like, okay, Google long hair men, which my wife would probably be like, what's that now in your search history? But it's for this purpose. And then it's like, okay, and there's this guy, Harry Styles, I think. And then there's this guy, Jason. <laughs> And I'm like, okay, Weber, you can do it. And then this is from like a couple days ago. All right. I look like Professor Snape's sad son. I don't think I'm doing it right. 
and again, it's pulled back right now. I pretend like it's a founding father cut. You know, I live in Charlottesville. Maybe I can do that. But like in general, we look at ourselves and I think doing that changes us. And there's research here. Go and look at all the research on this whole notion of like people having to stare at themselves. People having to stare at anything. So one study, 50 healthy young adults stare in a mirror, low lighting, after one minute, 66% of them reported seeing big, big uh, deformations in their faces. One minute. How many minutes have we been on Zoom? Have you guys been looking at yourselves now? Have you been looking at me? Like, this is a phenomenon. This is crazy. This is the report. This mirror gazing, visual perception. Again, it's this whole notion, which I'm going to reference um, and, and uh, a professor at Harvard when I was there, it was something that fascinated me. It's this value of what are we doing? Are we slowing down? Are we thinking more critically of ourselves? What is this deceleration, this immersive attention that like when I'm on an hour Zoom call and last week or two weeks ago, I was on six hours of Zoom on a Friday, on a Friday. And I gotta tell you by the six hour, I was like, yeah. I've stared at myself more today than I think I have in the previous entire year. Um, I wonder now, in this world of us sort of becoming these avatars of ourselves, I know this is me, but it's a video version of me, but it's a controlled version of me and you only get to see part of it. And I get to control what's in the back. I get to control this um, and I wonder now, is there something about us as human beings where there's this performative art element to what we do on Zoom? Yes, today I'm teaching, I'm performing, but we are all in some way interacting in ways that are uncharted territories for us in so many ways. Jennifer Roberts, professor of art history, she did this thing when, when, when I was back up in Cambridge and it fascinated me. She thought she had a fairly simple solution to help American art history students appreciate the art of focusing. So my focus is on the art of digital communication. She focused on the art of focusing. And what she asked her students to do, and when she did this, it was the talk of Boston because it would just seem so crazy. But it, she asked them to pick a painting, a sculpture, or object made by an American artist and stare at it for three hours. Three hours. Okay, I stared at myself for like, you know, 15 seconds. That study talked about people staring at themselves for a minute. What are you gonna find or do in this act of staring for three hours? I'm gonna tell you the results. And if you have the time, and some of us might have that time right now, I don't know what kind of good art we have lying around the house, but you know, Google it. The Louvre can be digital. Um, they're skeptical at first, as I would be as you should be now, but afterwards they tell me the process was really astonishing, enabling them to see things, make observations, develop original ideas about the work that they never would have occurred otherwise. What does three hours in front of a painting do for you? And here's where I'm bringing it back home. Here's the thesis. You want the one sticky thing to take away from this aside from some fun little Zoom trivia facts. What if this year, was the equivalent of staring at this painting, this tableau of 2020? What if we've been staring at this piece of art that is being co-created, that is out there, that is existing, that is changing, that we have some say over in terms of how we react to it, but it is a tableau that has crowdsourced components to it on a daily basis, ups and downs. How are we transformed? What have we become? What if this year was the equivalent of staring at a piece of art for three hours? What are the observations? What are the original ideas? What is the work that you have found and discovered about yourself that you would have never had occurred? To me, all good questions I'm asking myself as 2020 wraps up, thank you. 
And to be honest with you, all questions that I hope you all have a chance to ask yourselves as well. And by the way, I'll end a little bit early so you can go find a piece of artwork and tell your partner or your kids, be back in three hours because this is 2020, folks. This is the unadulterated me staring at it. It's not just the headshot. It is me looking it down saying, I am not going to blink. We are almost through it. And I hope the same for you. And I hope you come through 2020 in some really, really transformative, unique way that allows you to be better, to do good, to be good. But I also think you shouldn't change everything about you. Some things haven't changed, to be honest with you. Uh, last year at this very same event, some folks on this call right now may have recalled that I was able in this building, I think it was a Hotel B or something or a Colonnade Club or whatever, I was able to provide John Jeffries, who was in attendance, a turkey. By the way, John, you may have noticed, I like totally, I pretended like it was randomly under a seat and I knew where you were sitting. I had you distracted and I put the little butterball winning ticket underneath your seat and it's, it's gonna happen again, so just watch out. So again, John Jeffries, a lion of the university, a wonderful man. Also other wonderful people in this, in this picture too, a vice president, Margot Rogers and a communication speech writing extraordinaire, Kyle O'Connor, uh, who's just some of my dearest friends in this photo. I gotta tell you, like John Jeffries, there should be a turkey sub delivered from end zone pizza and subs on your front porch right now. I can't be there to bring it to you, but this is the proof. And I tipped, I probably should have tipped better, but like there should be turkey to close out the year, which to me is just saying like, yes, you got a butterball turkey in person. This year, Grubhub drops it off in grinder form. Some things have to change, but some things don't. And as far as I'm concerned, it's a bacon cheese fries kind of year too, Mr. Jeffries. And I threw some of those in this year. Um, closing out my friends, for those who were in attendance or those who weren't, I pulled a harmonica out of my pocket and I said, it's a UVA event. We've talked about love. We are part of a UVA family. Never thought I'd say that two and a half years ago using the word we with UVA, but it has happened. And I just wanna tell you that like, if it's okay with you all, I'm gonna play you harmonica <laughs> via Zoom. So you know it's gonna be bad, but it doesn't matter because it's the whole spirit. I wanna thank you all. Bless you to your family from this totally creepster guy. If you ever see him on the street, look away. And folks, I'm gonna open this up to the gallery view, stop my share, and I am gonna play a song that, again, you might know, it's called um, The Good Old Song. I love you all. I love you all. All the Greek forms. I, you guys are the best. John Jeffries, enjoy your grinder or hoagie or whatever you call it. <laughs> Thank you. It's 706. Go stare at some paintings. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> that was great. We did, we did get a couple of questions. Do you wanna do you wanna um do you want to answer one or two or are you done? <laughs> I'm not, I'm no, of course. <laughs> okay. Um, 
That was awesome, by the way. And I was wondering if either the turkey or the harmonica were going to make it a, an appearance. Um, but uh, Arts on the Hill, such a great and amazing way to bring people together. Um, how did that come to be? That's it's the call, Jim Ryan. Um, he started the whole thing as a as a live event at his house. The Hill is Cars Hill, and they hosted a really great event right before the um, right before the event. I mean, Stacy Stacy Smith was one of the organizers. I think she's on the call. Pam Higgins, all sorts of wonderful colleagues in the arts office and the president's office. They put it together, and then like all of these events were kind of, you know, postponed or canceled. So this whole notion of, well, how do we take the concept of that beautiful first event and convert it into something that can work out well? So Jim was like, hey, let's, let's do a show. And for every Sunday night for quite some time, we put the word out there. Jody Kilbasa was helpful. Jess Harris was amazing. Veronica Merrill, so many people um, put it together, Margaret Grundy. And just everyone was like, hey, let's, uh, let's source some stuff. Let's bring it in. Let's reach out to people. And it became this big hit. I think that the current count right now is there have been over 270 views of Arts on the Hill in this past year. So that's a show that is produced by, the, by us, by the community. Um, the University Communications Office, Vinny Barcelona and Eric Duda edited the first season. Myself and Jess Harris are editing the second season. And if you guys have any talents or honestly, just an instrument, uh, you know, send it our way. You can you can uh, set that up. We're starting season three in January. So yeah, oh, Again, that's, all, all Jim Ryan. That's awesome. Um, okay, question about Zoom in person interaction. Obviously, it's not so easy right now. Almost impossible. How can we build trust to open a good conversation using Zoom? Yeah, I think it's. I mean, so I didn't use all the tools of Zoom. I mean, I think one of the beautiful parts of Zoom is the breakout room function. Um, and I think for me, again, Jerry and Brian modeled this so well, is they would they would have these classes and then they would, um, you know, like lecture. So we talk about a case study or talk about an issue. And then we go into, into breakout rooms. And those were really powerful ways to get to know um, my colleagues um, and, and classmates. And I think, you know, the more you can do uh, a combination of big scale things like what we're doing now, but then also like, hey, you know, if we had another 40 minutes, let's do breakout rooms and analyze what it means to look at oneself for the past year and art and whether or not you agree or disagree with the sort of theses I put out there today. And I think you would learn more in those like 30 minutes together than whatever like little, little sticky thing you learned from me today. So I think doing some of that stuff is great. Love seeing my, the McGarrens up there. Hi, everyone. And Mark Llewellyn stayed on the whole time. Oh my gosh, wow. In a tie. <laughs> In a tie. He said he wore that tie for me. And Jerry too, thank you. You guys are the best. And uh, last question, very important. Where do you think is the best pizza? And what metric did you use to come up with that? Ooh, who, who asked that question? I have to look back, hold oh. on. <laughs> uh, okay, let me think. I mean, honestly, the best pizza in Charlottesville, and you can like Google or check out my Facebook page. My wife, who's Irish and Scottish, makes the best pizza ever. Mm -hmm. It's really good. It's all like homemade sauce, homemade whatever. Mm -hmm. We had a pizza stone um, and it's really good. So I would say Nell's Pizza, Nell, um, very common pizza place name, Nell's Pizza is the best. Um, if you can't get that, I mean, my go-to is Christian's. Um, Christian's is good. Lampo's good. Loose on the downtown mall has really good pizza. They only make it over the weekends, but if you can get that, their pasta and pizza is amazing. I know people like other stuff. Oh, Zakir is saying, what about Pizza Hut? Zakir, who, who, by the way, you know, started off as an, a colleague and became such a dear friend, like so many other people at UVA <laughs> to me. Zakir and I went to Pizza Hut once and then vowed to never do that again. He's in England on a Fulbright scholarship. Amazing man, hopefully not eating um, Pizza Hut right now, but I'm sure it's out there. Um, what, what else? That was it. That was the biggest one. Oh, okay. I mean, I talk about was, pizza. The next, next was, year's talk is just pizza, okay? <laughs> The next one was, what do you do to get out of a creative roadblock? I swim, no joke. 
honestly, oh, really? for me, if I can, and I haven't been doing it lately because it's a little bit less safe and we're actually, we're, we're trying to do some quarantining to visit some family in a, in a week or so. But for me, if I can get some good exercise in the form of swim, I put those goggles on, you jump into the water, you do some laps, you get out, you're a different person. And, um, and you're ready to take on the day. Sadly, I do it at night a lot. So I'll be like, hey, I'm ready to do everything. And it's like 10 o'clock at night. My wife's like, it's bedtime. So um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, exercise, swimming, all, all of that jazz is good for me. That's awesome. Um, I, don't, I don't think we have any other questions um, tonight, but just thank you so much, Matt. This was just an awesome, awesome hour for all of us. Can't thank you enough. Well, I'm grateful to everyone who's, who's listening and watching. It means the world. I know six o'clock is a hard time. And I know some, of, some people, you know, you know, getting away from your, your evening on a Tuesday night to, to listen to this um, is tricky. I do hope John Jeffries did get that grinder. If not, some sort of wolf uh, near the airport <laughs> is eating it. Uh, or I'm going to like, you know, write to Grubhub. But anyway, uh, nice, nice seeing you all. And, uh, and, and whatever holidays you celebrate, happy holidays. And I, I mean it when I say this, the, the love that I feel towards this group of people that many of whom I know, but some of whom I don't is there. And again, I thank Zoom for it. And I thank you, Pam. Congratulations on a wonderful tenure as president. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, everyone.